I think most important, you just have to appreciate what I tell my coaches in my course, every day is an interview. And so no matter where you're at, if you're training youth athletes, dominate that opportunity, right? If you're training community college athletes, dominate that opportunity. If you're training division one athletes, dominate that. And wherever you end up at, wherever your current kind of opportunity is, you need to dominate that opportunity because... If you're looking to pass the CSCS piece of cake, we got you covered. Two months, our online course. We'll get live classes on our study guide. But more importantly, our internship and CPT gets you access to strength coaches like Coach Ram, strength coach for the Kansas Jayhawks basketball team. Has a ring. Check out the call that he did with us. Really fortunate to have him. Let us know what you think. It's all about showing up. Doc Ramsey is... The current head coach, for, head strength coach for the Kansas Jayhawks. You can see his little story right here where uh, he got his master's degrees at 22, uh, assistant coach and strength coach at 23, head strength coach by 25, doctorate in sports performance at 27. And then last year he won his first ring with Kansas Jayhawks. And, and so the CSCS preps you for specific sports, but you can take a lot from the CSCS and as Doc and I were talking before, uh, I think it was Thursday or last week, he's just like, yeah, you know, I can't tell you the freaking Krebs cycle anymore. <laughs> he's like, your athletes don't care about that. It's about getting the buy-in. And so we're really excited to have him on the call today and he'll be able to, yeah, it's just, think of these as great opportunities to talk with people who are not only really smart and passionate, but they have the grit and they have done what most of us want to do. And so you can look at his, you know, his credentials and you see his blue check mark. You can see his, his credentials with the PhD and working with the Kings. But what you don't see is all the hard work and the dedication behind all of this. And so super hardworking individual. And it's just really neat to see uh, the success that someone has. And so really excited to have him on the call right here. And I see that you're right there, Doc. How are we doing? Hey. I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Happy Monday to you. My lighting. Yeah. Sorry, um, uh, tardy everybody. Little miscommunication on our part, but I am here. That's the most important part there. Showing up, right? <laughs> uh, it worked out perfect. Yeah, I had you down for noon my time, and I just walked in the door from our first practice, so uh, it works out all right. How'd that go today? What were you guys doing? Uh, a lot of plays today, a lot of plays. We got our first game next week. Well, we got a scrimmage or exhibition this week, and then uh season kicks off pretty soon here. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's fast approaching, and uh, we got to get ready. We got uh, how many? 22, so 20, 20 people besides us too. Nice. Yeah, this is recorded, so we have a lot of people that can't make the 8 a.m. calls because they work and so forth, but you know, there'll be a lot of people listening to this as well. So we just wanted to – get an opportunity to hear more about your story. I was just showing them going over that last post you had with your story and you got your master's, your PhD. And I was even explaining to them that it's you know, on paper, it looks so easy. You don't get to see all the work that goes in behind the scenes. And so, you know, just love to hear more about where you're at today, how you got there. And then we'll pick your brain a little bit about some adversity that you've hit. And, and we'll ask some specific questions to, to coaching and, and training and you know, we won't take longer than you know 45 minutes of your time so again really appreciate you taking the time today yeah absolutely well you know first off thank you for having me everybody and thanks for dedicating some of your time to to show up to this and uh shout out to chris we connected uh just about a week ago really and made this happen pretty quick so glad, glad to do it um chris i know you sent over some questions um you know, what's kind of best? You want me to just go into a little bit of backstory or what, what did you have planned? Yeah, that'd be great if we could do that. And then just to kind of set the expectations and then I'll start answering or asking some of those questions that I sent over and just, you know, we can, anyone that has questions specifically, you can ask in the chat box and then we'll, we'll get those answered. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So, uh, you know, popped in a little late there. Not sure how much Chris already mentioned, but uh, originally from California, Northern California Bay Area, and uh, did my undergrad in Southern California, well, undergrad and master's, so undergrad at UC Santa Barbara, and master's at Cal State Fullerton, and then uh, doctorate at Rocky Mountain University, which is in Provo, Utah, that was a hybrid program, so I was able to coach while earning that, um, 
and dissertation specifically was on workload and injury prediction in the NBA. So kind of a passion for understanding why people get hurt and uh, can we use, you know, data to try to prevent or reduce the risk of those things. So that's kind of the academic background. Um, you know, the coaching background is had many stops along the way, was a personal trainer at one point at Crunch Fitness uh, to pay for my master's and then, you know, went obviously full, full go into sport performance. So worked at, um, you know, UC Santa Barbara as a performance coach, worked at Santa Barbara City College as a performance coach, was fortunate to, to work in the NBA for five years with the Sacramento Kings. Uh, and then three years ago, the University of Kansas called and, um, you know, ended up coming here. Uh, you know, and a lot of people have asked, why, why would you leave the NBA to go to college? We could certainly dive into those things, um, but I won't spend too much time on it now, just in case it's not of interest. Uh, been here three years. My first year was incredible. We were the number one team. We finished with 17. We lost three games that year, but we finished with 17 wins in a row. And then COVID happened. Fully convinced we would have won that year. If you look behind me, there's two wine bottles. One of them uh, says number one team, and that was from 20. 20 COVID year when there was no NCAA tournament. The second bottle is from winning the national championship, which we just did this past uh, April. I told myself at the end of 2020 when I got that wine bottle, and I don't even like wine, but I told myself that the day that we win a national championship, I'll drink that whole bottle of wine. I have not done that. It is sitting right <laughs> there, uh, but it is uh, it is nice to put those two next to each other because the majority of our team that won it this year in 2022 was on that 2020 team. So it felt like redemption a little bit. Um, and coincidentally, which is actually crazy, in 2020, University of Kansas men's basketball was the number one team. University of South Carolina women's basketball was the number one team. COVID happened, there was no tournament. And in 2022, both of our teams ended up winning the entire thing. Uh, and then we had uh, an awards ceremony in New York and that was really cool to share that moment with them. Just, uh, I don't know if there's karma or what in the world, but somehow we managed to do that together. So um, that's kind of the, the backstory, the academic background, the coaching background. And then in addition to that, <clears throat> you know, I always like to tell people I have an entrepreneurship spirit. So I do have a coaching course now <clears throat> that has actually just been really incredible and become a real passion project of mine. And, um, you know, it's uh, the Applied Performance Coach is, is, the, is the course, is the company name. And uh, fortunate to have hundreds of coaches, performance coaches, athletic trainers, and physical therapists that take the course. And now really, you know, excitingly able to put a lot of people into really exciting opportunities. So, you know, we have over 15 coaches in the NBA now and coaches all over the world and um, coaches from the five major sports markets, which is just crazy to me. So NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, and MLS, and coaches and practitioners from those Five leagues have all taken the course with incredible feedback. And to be honest, I make the <clears throat> I made the course over COVID. I spent six months on a whiteboard, created a course. I live in Lawrence, Kansas alone, and I'm able to connect with coaches around the world and do things like this. So it's really an honor and a privilege to do that. So I'll stop. I'll take a breath here uh, and open it up to, to maybe some feedback or questions from you guys. But that's me in a nutshell. That's awesome. I uh, appreciate you to give that summary. Uh, it's it's such a cool journey that you've done. And I know that a lot of people are wondering, they, they reach out to me, at least when they get into the CSCS class that we teach, and they're wondering, you know, how do you get to the NBA? So, you know, that's like a, you know, a big ass mountain. And so I'd love to hear about how you were able to get there, whether it's internships, if it was the right people that you know, uh, how did you get to start working with the Kings? Yeah, yeah good question. I mean, <clears throat> like most things, you know, in this world, uh, you know, your, your your net worth is your network, as they say, and uh, having connections undoubtedly helps. Uh, and so I was fortunate that when I worked at UC Santa Barbara as a performance coach, the <clears throat> one of the gentlemen that had left that university who was my boss at the time and supervisor at the time. He went to the Brooklyn Nets. The guy who replaced him is a guy named Chip Schaefer, who uh, was Phil Jackson's right hand guy. He's a Southern California guy as well. And um, he spent, you know, 30 years in the NBA at this point, but he was Phil Jackson's guy. So he was an athletic trainer for the Bulls in the 90s. He obviously got six rings with MJ. When Phil went to the Lakers, he was there as well, got five more with Kobe and Shaq. And um, just so happened that his son went to UC Santa Barbara. And when Phil Jackson retired, 
and UC Santa Barbara needed a director of performance, Chip ended up taking on that job. Uh, and that's where I met him. I worked with him for six months and he tried to convince me to stay and not go and do a brick and mortar masters, do an online master just so I can work with him. Uh, I told him, you know, Chip, I really appreciate it, but I really want to get into a lab and get that experience. And so we just stayed in touch. He was from Orange County and I was at Cal State Fullerton. So anytime he would come home, we'd grab some lunch and build that relationship. And then you fast forward just, you know, two years later, he's back in the NBA. He needs an assistant and he calls me and says, hey, would you be interested? And of course, it was my dream job. And so I said, Chip, I'd definitely be interested in the only thing that I asked is that I had started a doctorate at the time. I said, as long as I can finish school, I don't even care what the salary is, but if you just let me finish school, I'm, I'm fully in. And uh, obviously he let me do that. So that was kind of the start of what has turned into a, a pretty uh, exciting career. I was 23 at the time. That was 2014 and 2016. Imagine this, I'm 25 years old and Chip leaves back to home to Chicago Bulls and they can, they can post that job and have anybody in the world apply, right? Hundreds of applicants, high quality people, people that are older than me with more experience than me and more qualified than me. But over my two year period as an assistant, I was able to, I think, just prove that, that I, I would be the guy, you know, that could take on that role and, and take the lead in that. Um, and that came from various, I think, reasons. One was the relationships I was able to build. One was obviously an academic background and excitement and passion for the science of what we do. And then I think the last but not least part is, you know, I would say you got to be able to wear a lot of different hats when you work in high performance sport. One moment I'm talking with the athlete and I'm playing rap music and I'm talking shit and I'm getting them to buy in. The next moment a coach walks in and I got to put a more professional hat on, right? And be able to communicate that. The next moment uh, a player's wife might come in and say, hey man, I'm trying to lose five pounds. How do? And so now I got to put more of kind of a personal trainer hat on, right? And explain kind of that weight loss communication and then I might be up in a in a meeting with a front office member and so uh, I think being able to do that over those two years just showed the the organization that I could handle that role and so um, was able to land that at 25 and then at 28 Kansas called and been here three years as I mentioned so I'm 31 now but uh, you know spent the majority of my 20s just really uh, having some incredible opportunities and they all have come from somebody giving me a hand. So oh. Did you learn under Dr. Galpin? Uh, I did. Yeah, actually, we actually published a paper together. So uh, we have a paper out there called the bilateral force deficit. And that was me and Galpin published that. Um, so, yeah, he was at Forward 10 when I was there, along with, you know, other incredible um, professors and researchers. Dr. Galpin is really big, obviously, on social media. And so a lot of people know his name uh, and, he, and rightfully so. He does an incredible job. And there's some really incredible people that are there as well that don't have any social following. Uh, but there was a few few people in there. I and mean, a guy named Dr. Lee Brown was the president of the NSCA for some time. He was at um, Fullerton. Um, Dr. Brent Alvar, who is currently the president of the NSCA is actually my dissertation chair. Uh, so he's another kind of academic advisor that I have. So, uh, but yes, to answer the question, Dr. Galpin was there when I was there at Fullerton. The reason I was asking, because I interviewed him about that two months ago, and one of the things I love that he said is that for new strength coaches, the answer is always yes. And I just mm -hmm. thought that's really, really powerful because today, especially with the you know, entitled, whether it's entitlement, if it's a lack of work ethic, whatever it may be, it's like people think that um, I got my CSCS, I'm a strength coach. Okay, I'm going to have all these job opportunities just lined up. So you think maybe you could give some of your own advice on uh, what would those pointers be to to get to where you're at, whether it's the networking, the buy-in, and just overall uh, just being successful. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're, you know, trying to, I think, just make a path in high-performance sport. And when I say high-performance sport, it's typically you want to work in, you know, high-level Division One um, or professional sports settings. And I think if that's the goal, um, then I think the advice that I would give is, you know, the same things that you do in any career, right? Show up early, stay late, um, you know, treat people the right way. And I think most important, you just have to appreciate what I tell my coaches in my course, every day is an interview. And so no matter where you're at, if you're training youth athletes, dominate that opportunity, right? If you're training community college athletes, dominate that opportunity. If you're training division one athletes, dominate that. And wherever you end up and wherever your current, kind of opportunity is you need to dominate that opportunity because 
your future opportunity is going to come from your current opportunity typically right and so you know for me if i wasn't um showing up early staying late studying and showing uh chip that i was you know really passionate about this and excited about this then he would have never gave me an opportunity when he, he got to the nba right and um and there's so many examples of that, right? Same thing when I get to the NBA, if I get complacent and content and just happy to be there and I get lazy because I'm getting on charter planes or staying at the Ritz Carlton's, well, when Chip leaves, they don't give me that opportunity as the head guy. And if I'm the head guy and I say, well, you know, I bought my first house and I'm, I'm, you know, getting content, I'm happy I made it. Well, the reason I got to Kansas was because we had scouts that had been watching me work at the Sacramento Kings and they knew coach self. Right. And so, you know, and, and if I get here and it's the same thing, if I get lazy and content, maybe I'm not able to contribute and win a national championship because, you know, the guys that we played, we were able to put on 20 pounds on some of these kids and that certainly played a role in winning a title. So uh, I think it's just always appreciating no matter where you're at, don't ever feel like you're bigger than your current opportunity because your future opportunity is going to come from your current one. I love that. Dominate the opportunity. That's that's great. That's an awesome quote right there. I could see that in big letters right behind you. <laughs> and so Absolutely. how would you get some of that buy-in from your athletes? I think that was one of the main questions people were asking. How would you answer that one? Yeah, I mean, buy-in, I think, you know, I always tell people I don't have a lot of superpowers, um, but one of them is probably buy-in from, from athletes, especially basketball athletes, because we're tasked with asking them to do things they typically don't want to do, right? If you look at a football training culture, there's a direct correlation and a direct transfer and a, and what I would call a surface level transfer. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to, to figure out that if I'm bigger, faster, stronger than you, and we both play football, there's a chance I'm going to hit you harder or run faster than you or ultimately be better than you. And then when you get into, you know, more skill-based sports, um, you know, in basketball, it's all on a continuum, but uh, basketball isn't as direct. There's certainly still some direct transfer, right? If you jump higher and all those things. Uh, but I, I say that to say that most basketball players don't necessarily like the weight room. They just understand that they need to do it. And so the ways that I create buy-in, uh, you know, things that come to mind, top of mind would be first and foremost is I'm me all the time. And guys know that. Um, and there's a consistency that they get with me that they expect from me. And so whether or not they like me, like if you don't like me, you're probably never going to like me because I'm going to show up who I am every single day. I'm not going to pretend to be somebody else. Uh, the second one is that I try to become and try to be very relatable with our athletes. And <clears throat> the good thing about Kansas now is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 31. As I mentioned, most of my players are around 21. So I have this 10 year age gap where, I'm close enough in age to be relatable, right? I, I, I'm hip to the social media that they use. Um, you know, I'm hip to the music they listen to. Some of the shows maybe we're watching on Netflix or whatever those things are. The pop culture things that come to mind, I can communicate at uh, or communicate to, but I'm also old enough to talk to them about buying a home or when I make a comment about life, they can kind of sit there and listen. So I think there's some of that. And then last but not least, I just, my guys know that I really want them to win. And it's selfish. I tell them that. I tell them, I really want you guys to go to the NBA because if you go to the NBA, I look better. So there's a selfish component to me wanting you to win. And I find that communicating to that, communicating that to them really gets them to understand and believe in it because it's very much true. If all of you go to the NBA, I'm going to get paid more. I'm going to look way better. So why would I not want you to go to the NBA? And so with that in mind, you should buy into the fact that anything I ask you to do is ultimately to help you get to the NBA because it's selfish. I want to look better. And that approach has, I think, really resonated with them because um, there's never a doubt like, oh, Ram doesn't want me to get better. No, Ram does want you to get better because I want to win more championships. I want to get more wine bottles and ultimately I want to be here for a long time. And so that's how winning achieves those things. So those are things that come to mind with buy-in, but I could obviously give specific examples if that uh, if that's of interest or a question. Yeah, I, I think that you could answer this one way better than I can because I had a kid who was going through the program and he's working as a strength coach in Turkey. And he's 22, 23. And one of the older guys on the team, like in his early 30s, he's having a really hard time connecting with him. The guy's kind of a dick. And so he was asking like, you know, what can I do to, to get that buy-in from some of these older players? Because they look at me and they see the young buck or whatever it may be. So I'd love to see how you'd handle that situation. 
Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's showing up uh, and being you every day. Um, I think that oftentimes you get these questions, and I get them too, and you never want to compromise who you are for buy-in. And the reason I bring that up is if you have a team of 20 people and there's one or two guys that aren't buying in, if you compromise who you are to get those two to buy in, you may lose the other 18. And so uh, I never compromise kind of my approach because I know that the majority of our athletes are buying and it's resonating with them. Now, if somebody's being a dick, I think it's ultimately your relationship. This isn't where it needs to be. And so you need to just take a step back and say, why don't we have a relationship that we need to obviously create the buy? Now, it could be maybe you're you're too much of a strength coach, right? All you ever talk to them about is strength and conditioning. So maybe you need to get to know them, ask about their family, ask about their class, how's school going? Um, or make mental notes. Or a big thing I do is I carry a clipboard with me all the time. Whenever I'm on the workout floor, I got a clipboard, I got the program and I got a pen on me. And so I'll make little notes. If someone says, hey, Ram, I, you know, my left knee is kind of bu bu bugging me or bothering me, I'm gonna write that down. And then the next day I'm gonna ask them, how's your left knee doing? Okay, let's try this today. How's your left knee doing? And even if it doesn't work, what they see is that I actually care deeply about them. It's not just about showing up on time. Those things matter, but I care about you deeply. So for guys that are, you know, being assholes or dicks or not buying in, I think almost come in real soft on them, right? And say, hey, man, you can be an asshole, but I'm going to care about you deeply today. So how's your knee doing? How's your, hey, man, you mentioned this last week. Hey, man, I heard, hey, it, I just had this example. We had a player that, uh, he's got some stuff going on. And I heard in the coach's locker room, they were talking about it. I said, oh, what happened? They explained to me. Now, it wasn't a conversation for me. So I didn't go up to the athlete and try to give him advice or anything. I went up to him after practice said, you know, hey, so-and-so, I heard what's going on, man. Keep your head up. And you got to, you know, and just let him know that I heard about it and I'm here for you. And that's all you have to do sometimes. So I think that if you got someone that's not buying in, come in soft on them and when, kill them with kindness. And eventually they'll come around as long as you're consistent with who you are. It's hard to buy into someone if they're not consistent, right? The the worst type of athletes are the ones that are awesome on one day and then they're they're rude the next day. And some days they're happy and they say good morning. Other days they don't talk to. You. We don't like that as human. Just it's human nature. We don't like inconsistency. And so for you as a coach, you need to be consistent. So my guys know every day I'm gonna be the same person. I love that. That's awesome. So what would you say would be the biggest differences between that pro level to collegiate level? I mean, you're talking you're talking about the you know, the cream of the crop in basketball, and then you know, you're in the NBA. So what would you say those big differences would be? Yeah, I mean, I think in college, you're just more of an authority position, right? So like, there's an expectation for me to tell them what to do here, for me to hold them accountable when they're late, um, for me to challenge them as men and to develop that side of things. Um, and ultimately for me to jump their ass when I need to jump their ass. There's an expectation because I'm a coach and you're a player and there is a hierarchy of kind of power, right? In the NBA, it's not the case. It's peer to peer at best, but really it's a player driven league. And so even though you're the strength coach, even if you're the head strength coach, um, it's not the same authority type position, right? It's more of a peer to peer relationship you have to build. And so uh, now I try, I, I build a peer to peer relationship here as well. But there's just an expectation at the college level that I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to jump your ass. I'm going to hold you accountable. There's more of a culture component to these things versus the college or the NBA. It's more of a, a coddled relationship, right? It's more of a peer to peer. Uh, there's a lot more flexibility here. When the team trains, you have to train. In the NBA, you don't really train as a team. It's flexible. Um, so I think that those are the biggest differences. Just kind of the power struggle that that is built into the hierarchies at the NBA or professional level versus here. And most of that comes from the money side, right? Like those players are getting paid a hundred plus million dollars a year to play basketball. Um, you know, you're not getting that. And so it, there's an obvious uh, uh, hierarchy there that the player is going to probably be more important than the individual staff member. That's great. Um, Some of you here in the, the chat box are asking about some advice for going through a strength and conditioning internship or program. And what would be some things that you would look for or drive you to want to go there? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're, um, and maybe uh, there's a lot to unpack there, I think, but ultimately if, if you don't have experience and you're looking to get experience, then you need to take any experience that can come about. So, you know, uh, it's hard to be picky when you don't have options. So now if you have three different internship opportunities on the table and you have to pick one, then now we, we have some options and we can look at some different things. And so from there, all things being equal, if you have three opportunities or two opportunities, I would look at the track record of that internship program. 
who have they placed and where have they gone into? If you want to go to the NBA, for example, and no one's ever been to the NBA through that program, that's probably that that may not be the program for you, right? And that's probably not a great example because not many people have been in the NBA. But same thing, if if you're an intern and you're working with a football team and you got an internship opportunity at a D1 program, well, you say, well, where have former interns gone on to? Are they are they head football strength coaches at Division two or mid major Division one or high level Division one programs? Is there a track record here? Um, and usually, it just comes down to the head the head supervisor, the head strength coach. What's their their coaching tree? Um, and then beyond that, you can always look and typically you can find it online. Who, what are the former interns that have gone through this? Can I contact them? Can I ask them about their experience and can I learn what to expect? Um, but I always say, if you, if you do want to get in the field, uh, you know, there's kind of the same, like you get, you kind of got to eat crap for a little bit. Like the, it's not going to be, you're not walking into six figures paying jobs. Uh, you're going to have to show up early. You're going to have to stay late. You're going to have to set up weight rooms. You're going to have to clean weight rooms. You're going to have to do all the things that you don't want to do. But it's the same for almost any industry. Like every industry has some dues that you have to pay. Um, and strength and conditioning is no different. And so, uh, you know, you hear a lot of criticisms out there. I think I just tweeted this a few days ago. You hear a lot of the criticism about the salaries that are in the SNC field or the things you have to do or the hours, et cetera. And it's like, yeah, that all that is true. But then you you have the examples on the other end as well. I mean, you got, I think the guy at Iowa State getting a million dollars a year to be the head football strength coach. And so, and there's there's multiple people getting paid over six figures. I mean, there's hundreds of people getting paid over six figures and there's, you know, at least 10 plus getting over 500,000 in division one football. Um, and so I never look at salaries as like, you know, let me get an internship and then go get a good salary. I look at it as where do I want to be in 10 years? And if, if you want to be in coaching, then start at the bottom and, and you'll work your way up. And as long as you're a good person, you dominate your opportunities, you do all the things we're talking about today, you'll end up in a position that is pretty good. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think that's kind of what comes to mind is just uh, if you don't have options, go get experience and stop being picky. And then if you do have options, do your homework on those options to pick the best one for you. And it's so true with just that mindset where if you come in with that fixed mindset, you're a victim no matter what you do, you're going to always find the negative versus that growth mindset. And it's like, all right, well, here's my experience, the career capital that I've, I've uh, developed. You know, let's you know create a stream of revenue like you have with your program. And you're still doing what you love, but you're looking at other opportunities, whether if it's virtually or, or so forth. And, you know, that those opportunities will present themselves if you're always, you know, taking that positive growth mindset. So that's a good piece of advice right there. Now, when you get into more of the Every day, some people are asking questions about actually like strength and conditioning. So could you kind of walk us through what a, a day would look like today with the, the notion that next week there is going to be some games coming in, you have some practices. And so I know it's a lot, I don't know for a fact, but it's you know a lot more structured, I would say, with like, you know, going to bed and then like waking up and team eating. And so when I was at UConn, I saw a lot of that with the players, but love to see what they're doing at Kansas. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, today, you know, today's probably a typical day because there's two practices. <clears throat> um, but, you know, something like today, we, we practice seven to about nine. And then uh, we'll lift as a team at 145. And then we'll practice again at 245. And then hopefully they'll get out of there no later than five. And then they'll be able to go get some dinner. Um, and then hopefully shut it down from there. Uh, on a more typical day, like tomorrow, we'll have one practice at 245. We'll lift. I have two groups. We got eight athletes in each group. We got an 8 a.m. group, eight athletes in that. We got a 1:45 p.m. group, eight, eight eight athletes in that. And then we'll practice as a team at 2:45. And that's more of a typical day. I usually got two groups, and um, and we train about half the team in each. And then as we kind of gear up for our first kind of games, really next week, um, you know, hopefully we we get two wins under our belt. And uh, our big kind of game that's coming up is Duke on the 15th. And so for that game, we'll need to peak. So I'll back off of them. I'll cut training volume. So they feel explosive. They feel ready to go. They feel confident. Um, and so I periodize through the non-conference schedule around like five games, basically five games that I know are going to be really hard. They're going to determine some of our ranking and seating for later in March. Um, but all the other games, you know, we got a, an exhibition on Thursday. I don't even care about it. I don't care if they play sore. Um, so that's kind of what a day would look like from a grouping perspective and practice times. And then, you know, that's a little bit of insight into how I periodize their program. So for those groups today, is it based off conditioning? Is it based off of, you know, squad one, squad two? How do you break those up? Yeah, right now it's just based off a class schedule. 
And oh, then okay. once we get a rotation set, then it will become based off of kind of squad one, squad two. We have what we would call a scout team. So they practice, they get on the practice floor about 45 minutes before the regular team. So they'll train 45 minutes before. So we'll kind of have uh, groupings based off of basically playing time or playing potential. You know, your walk-ons and your red shirts and all those guys will end up in an earlier group. Uh, and then your rotational guys that are ultimately going to be on that floor will be in that second group. Could you take us through what that workout would look like today? Or sorry, tomorrow, you said it's more typical where you said you got eight guys and you got about 45 minutes for that workout? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, all my, all my programs are essentially, um, they're templated the same. And so you're going to come in, we're going to do some things that get you kind of loose and mobile, right? So we're going to, um, some of that is specific to your needs, right? If you're a guy that lacks hip internal rotation, you might get a hip, a shin box switch type exercise we're working on internal external rotation of the of the hip there um and then some of it's just specific to your knees as a basketball player so we might do some stuff for like your lower limb complex your calf complex um uh, and then some of it might also become specific for the lift that day so when we're doing our single leg lower body work tomorrow then we might do some single leg knee dominant pogo work to start to wake those legs up or those limbs up individually <laughs> and then we'll get into our lift um, and, you know, essentially we'll come down to, is it a bilateral or unilateral focus? Is it a power or strength focus? And then we'll build out around that. Um, and then we we'll usually end that, that becomes like your block A and block B, your primary lifts, your primary movements. And then, uh, off of that, at the end of the lift, it basically becomes some individual stuff. So like, I got a kid who has a chance to go to the NBA, but his upper body is very small, especially relative to his lower body. So he'll do some more upper body volume. Um, we got another kid who uh, is actually, you know, body composition wise, he's pretty good. He's got some tendon pain. He'll do some stuff for his knees, try to get that tendon going. Um, so some of that at the end, that accessory work just becomes individual specific stuff uh, based on who you are and what you need. Um, and then uh, we train three to four times a week. We have three traditional lifting days and then we have a recovery mobility type day. And I and the days aren't set because the practice schedule isn't set. So based on the practice schedule each week, I move the days around to correspond to our off days and on days um, and stuff like that. And now that games are coming, then, you know, our recovery days will get placed right after our games. We only play twice a week, so it's a little bit more manageable. Whereas in the NBA, you lift three and a half times a week. I mean, excuse me, you play three and a half times a week. So that's obviously a harder kind of program to manage when you're playing every other day. In the end, in college, you only play twice a week, so it's a little bit easier to manage. Yeah, speaking on uh, kind of like that, that dude who's trying to put on some size, someone asked earlier about, you know, what exactly did you – it's kind of a, it's a very big question, but, you know, what were some of the things that you did to help that guy put on 20 pounds earlier without compromising the power and agility? Yeah, I mean, the two big things that come to mind as far as gaining muscle and size without compromising – explosive ability whether that's vertical or lateral or speed and horizontal is um the first one is do it slowly so we put on 20 pounds over essentially like 30 months or so almost three years um and so do it slow and the second one is make sure that you're still playing basketball you're still doing explosive things for the most part putting on size is not what takes your athletic ability away Typically, we when when we think of you know putting on weight and we don't want to become slower, it's because we're comparing to powerlifters and bodybuilders who a aren't doing explosive things, they're not playing sport, and they typically put on weight much faster. <clears throat> the average gym goer, if you tell someone, "Oh, he's put on twenty pounds in three years," like that's not that impressive. Um, but for a basketball player, that's plenty because it means that when he came in as a freshman, he weighed one ninety eight. We got him to 218 to start his junior season. He lost about five and he played around 212, 213. Um, and he ends up going the first round in the NBA draft. And when he got here and he weighed under 200 pounds, there weren't many people that thought he could become an NBA player. You fast forward to, to just a few nights ago. I mean, this is a kid who plays for the Denver Nuggets. He hits three threes. He ends up locking up Jordan Poole. Um, you know, he's got some big highlights and people are saying he could become the steal of the draft. And it's like, three years ago he didn't even think he would be an NBA player and so uh, but we did it slow right we weren't there's no point to race you know when you're training high level athletes I always tell my guys what are you racing towards it, you hope to play this game until you're 40 
So why are we going to put on 20 pounds tomorrow? Can you do it? Sure. But is it going to make you better at basketball? Probably not. So the two biggest things, do it slowly and then make sure you're still doing the sport and power and explosive type movements. Great advice. Great advice. Question here on, can you touch briefly on what you were mentioning earlier about backing off on that volume and changing the program leading up to that peak week? Like for example, when you got Duke coming up. Yeah, it's, it's real easy. All I do is cut working sets. So if we got four working sets, we'll do two. So usually I just cut my working sets in half. Most of the other, most of the rest of the program stays the same. Our warm ups are going to stay the same. Our warm up sets will stay the same because most of that isn't enough to create any soreness or muscle damage. The working sets is obviously the money maker. And you know, if we had four working sets, we're going to cut it to two. If we had three, we might only do two, or we might do a harder warm up set with one true working set. Um, but it mostly comes down to basically cutting working set volume in half. Great. Thank you. Um, maybe just do a couple more questions again. Super appreciative of your time. I'm more curious on the, the mindset stuff. So when you're talking about some of your mentors that are working for the Kings and, and how they're helping you, uh, have you noticed much of a mindset shift from maybe those older generations to some of the kids today, like this kid coming in, maybe not having the expectations as you go into the league where maybe we see back in the day that the mindset was a little different. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not so much maybe like the league or, you know, going to the league versus not going to the league. I think for the most part, everybody thinks they're an NBA player. Um, this kid had an incredible amount of like humility that you typically don't see. I mean, I've, it's more common that I see players who, you know, aren't very good that think they're going to go to the NBA, right? Everyone <laughs> thinks they're going to the NBA. Um, and it's so hard to get there and it's even harder to stay there. And that's what I tell my guys, like, your first goal is to get there. The actual goal is to stay there because your first contract in the NBA isn't even isn't enough to do what I think most people think about. When they think I want to go to the NBA, they think they're going to buy multiple houses, multiple cars, have nice things, go on nice vacations, have lots of money, blah, blah, blah. And me being 31 now realizing like even a million dollars, you know, if you, someone was to hand you a million dollars, you really can't go retire. By the time you take out taxes, pay an agent and buy a home, you don't have much left over. How are you going to buy your parents a car or a house and those things? So this, this is what I explain to our guys. I'm like, look, even if you go in the lottery, you can get $2 million a year. Congratulations. You can get $3 million a year. Congratulations. That's awesome. What's better is staying in the league and signing 80, 90, 100 million. I had a, I have a player who signed a $170 million contract guaranteed and he FaceTimed me a few days later speechless. Like that's real money, obviously. Um, and so, you know, when I think about kind of some of our guys and their expectations and, and the mindset, I want them all to think they're the best players in the world. What I tell our guys, when you step in between those lines, you should think you're the baddest man on the planet. And when you step outside of those lines, you should have the humility to know that you're actually not the baddest man on the planet. And I think it's 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 that mindset shift that you have to have. You have to have, off the court. You need to know every day I need to get better. I need to get in that weight room. I need to get in that film room. I need to work on recovery. I need to get in that in that, uh, you know, that kitchen or get some food. Um, and then when you get in between them lines, you have to say, I know I got to get better, but I'm better than everybody out here. Even if it's not true, you have to have delusional confidence because that's what pushes a player to reach their potential. So when I think of mindset, I think, you know, I, I want every player to think that they can go to the NBA because I want them to try to achieve that. And I tell my guys all the time, the worst thing that you can do in life is to know that you didn't tap out your potential, right? You want to know that whatever I can do, I've reached my potential. Maybe that's not the NBA. Maybe for you, that's playing overseas. Well, you can make money overseas and you can make a lot of money. So um, yeah, that's kind of what comes to mind when I think of some of that mindset stuff is, is you know, Almost all my kids think that they're ready to go to the NBA, but the ones that have the humility to know that they need to get better every day, those, those are the ones that have a chance. Love it. Uh, Brock, did you have any questions that you wanted to bring up? He's our other instructor for the class. I just we put in here the, your, uh, your site on there. I left out a piece, and now we got that updated. Thank you. Anything you nice. wanted to ask Brock? Uh, my bad, my uh, Phones acting up, but uh, no, man. Uh, I, I kind of had a similar question, just as uh, Tyler did. Uh, first, I want to say th thanks a lot for this call, man. Uh, this, this is kind of great to hear, hear that applied aspect, and also, um, you know, uh, I think a lot of times we, we come across, um, you know, sometimes people either ha have an education background or not doing it applied wise, or and obviously a lot of applied and not the education, so I think that's uh, dope. But uh, no, I, I think my only question I was going to ask similar to Tyler is just kind of how do you 
uh, scale out during, you know, during a busy season, kind of, uh, you know, just dropping the sets. That's kind of what I thought. So, um, no, I think we're good on my end. Thanks a lot, uh, Doc. Yeah, thank you very much. And you're going to be out here in San Diego not too, not too long. What are those dates again? Yeah, so May, uh, hopefully we'll announce those in the coming weeks. May 19th, the 20th and 21st. I'll be doing an in-person event in San Diego. Um, and that'll be kind of our applied performance in person. We'll have some some guest lectures. I'll obviously lecture. Um, so we're gonna we're currently planning what should be a pretty exciting weekend of just growth and connection. Um, so yeah, May nineteenth, twentieth, and twenty first. I think May twentieth and twenty first we'll hold the event at Point Loma, uh, but we're gonna have some different events around kind of the main lecture portion. So that should be good. Um, and yeah, if anyone, you know, obviously I know there's a mixed crowd here, but if, if sport performance and applied sport performance is of interest, feel free to DM me. My Instagram is just at dr.ramsey.nigem. And Chris, you can share that if you haven't already. Um, and yeah, reach out. I'm, I'm available. You know, that's what I always tell people. I'm here to help and I'm excited to do it. So uh, whether it's at the, the in-person or whether it's just through Instagram or something, feel free to connect. And we'll send out those dates to everyone. We got a pretty good following. We had 29 people show up today on this one. So I really just appreciate your time today, Doc. And congratulations on the last year and another, you know, another great year for you guys. So thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. And appreciate everybody for showing up. You guys have a good one. All right, you too.